Hello everyone, welcome to my Evil Within 2, Akumu Difficulty, No Upgrade Sashki's Walkthrough, and this is part 1 of chapter 3, Resonances. And based on the no commentary version of this chapter, I'm sure you can understand why I've had to separate this particular chapter into individual parts. It's because it's the longest chapter on this game, but it's only long if you choose to engage in all the activities that chapter 3 provides. I chose to engage in all the activities, and it really caused the chapter to expand quite a lot, and I was enjoying the entirety of chapter 3 when I was recording it. I didn't die once, I was thinking through a lot of the sections, I was engaging with the enemies when I had to, I was using a lot of the really cool mechanics of this game, I was examining resonance points, I was really taking in the atmosphere of this whole entire area, and the culmination of all those factors together made this chapter absolutely enjoyable to play. But of course, it does come across as a bit of a double-edged sword, because on one side, I'm able to enjoy this chapter to such a great degree, and just really experience this game for what it is. But on the other side, it makes recording this particular chapter a little bit harder for me on the commentary side, because I have to edit out all the moments of chapter 3 that are completely unnecessary if you're coming to this walkthrough for strategies, because that's the whole point of a walkthrough. And then, with the amount of time I had devoted to chapter 3, it's going to make it very hard for me to find a lot of tangents to talk about. Of course, if I was Seraphim 17, on the other hand, I wouldn't be having any kind of trouble with this whatsoever, because Seraphim 17 is a connoisseur at commentating, because he always seems to find tangents to talk about, regardless of how long his videos are. And you're probably thinking, this is still the beginning of the game, you can probably talk about a lot of things, and that is true, there is a lot to talk about with regards to this game, and I could easily be making comparisons between this game and the Evil Within 1, I could be talking about the new mechanics, I could be talking about the boss fights, I could be talking about the enemy types, I could be talking about the kinds of opinions that people have about this game, and why I feel that a lot of the opinions that people have are just really bad. But I still feel like with the length of time it has taken me to actually record this chapter, that by the end of it, I'm just not going to have enough ideas to talk about. And as I'm saying this, I've already taken up about 2 minutes and 10 seconds worth of the video just to explain this particular tangent. So, maybe that's a good start. Maybe I'll actually have a lot to talk about with this particular chapter. So in the beginning of chapter 3, you'll want to go ahead and interact with that workbench, so you can gain access to the ability to craft ammo outside of the workbench. Something you'll want to bear in mind when it comes to crafting outside of the workbench menu, it takes more resources to craft ammo when you're not using the workbench. When you're using the workbench itself, it'll take less ammo. And one of the cool things about the workbench system on the Kumu difficulty and on every other difficulty that's not classic difficulty, is that when you craft ammo, you create a checkpoint. So you can use that particular system as an alternative way of saving and not have to go to a save terminal. And on the topic of the save terminals, I actually like what they've done with the save terminals on this game compared to the first Evil Within, for one reason. On the first Evil Within, you were only allowed to make manual saves within the Asylum, so you had to do this rather lengthy process of going through the mirror, which took roughly 5-6 to six seconds, then get to the desk and make your manual save. And then, if you wanted to reload from that manual save, you had to leave the Asylum every single time, which was really dumb. And that's not even mentioning that on certain chapters of The Evil Within, there would be a unique event that would play whenever you entered the Asylum, and it took up too much time whenever you wanted to make a manual save. So that's why for my walkthrough, you didn't see me utilize the manual save once. Well, on this game, they've not only added a manual save system to the Asylum, but they've also added manual saves within Union. And this is so beneficial if you want to create manual saves for specific boss fights and not have to go through the Asylum every single time. And this is especially helpful in this game, when I'm trying to make a walkthrough, because on this game, there aren't that many loading screens. The first Evil Within always had loading screens in between chapters, and it made recording a walkthrough of that game very easy. But on this game, I don't have that luxury, so I have to utilize the manual save system to actually create a designated chapter save. That way, if I end up messing up, I can always replay the chapter from the beginning. And since there are manual saves within Union, I don't have to waste time leaving the Asylum just to get back into the gameplay. And even if I did have to reload from a manual save within the Asylum, I wouldn't mind it as much, because on this game, entering and leaving the Asylum is faster now, rather than it taking like 5-6 to six seconds just to get through the mirror. You get through the mirror in one second. It's so fast. I mean, on the first instance of going through the Asylum, it's not that fast, it's about as fast as the Evil Within 1. But every other time you go through that mirror, it will always be fast. It's so good, I'm so glad that they've made that change. But right there, I've just killed that one haunted using a mechanic from the first Evil Within, and this mechanic was first introduced in Resident Evil 4. If you watch my walkthrough of the Evil Within 1, you will understand that if you shoot enemies while they're sprinting in the leg, 
they will always fall over, so long as you're not in any kind of startup animation. On this game, it works a little differently. The only time you will ever be able to knock down a haunted by shooting them in the leg once is when they're in a very specific sprint animation, and it's this sprint animation you're seeing right now. And the good thing about this trap right here is it's going to slow her down, and she's going to be heavily susceptible to this particular mechanic. And that right there was the stomp, which works very differently compared to the first Evil Within. On the first Evil Within, the stomp could be done any time by pressing triangle on any fallen enemies or on any dead bodies. The, the dead body aspect was really stupid, it should not have existed, because oftentimes you would try to melee an enemy that was in front of you, and Sebastian would prioritize a dead body on the ground, which was so stupid, unless you aimed. If you aimed, you would never do the stomp. And whenever you did the stomp on that game, it would never instantly kill enemies. The only enemy that it instantly killed was the Alter Egos. But against the normal Haunted, it did absolutely nothing, and it was completely pointless, and it was just completely overshadowed by the match mechanic. However, on this game, because of the fact that the matches don't return, the developers decided to overhaul the stomp a little bit more. So, rather than being button-sensitive, it's a context-sensitive animation now that can only be triggered under very specific circumstances. And whenever you do the stomp, Sebastian will always hit the enemy with the stomp, and it will always instantly kill them. So the stomp at least serves a purpose now compared to the first Evil Within, where it was only useful during very specific circumstances. And it's so beneficial. You can even kill multiple enemies with one stomp, much like the melee animations from Resident Evil 4, 5, and 6, where whenever you use the melee attack, they would always hit multiple enemies if they were nearby. This whole system of shooting enemies in the leg once, and then punishing them with a stump, is so beneficial for saving your ammo. That right there is a definition of realistic feedback. That is Newton's first law, demonstrated in action. That is a mechanic that has existed in Resident Evil 4, 5, and 6, and also in the Evil Within 1, and it's back in this game. Only on this game, it's not as reliable as the first Evil Within. On the first Evil Within, every single running animation that the enemies did could be punished by shooting them in the leg once. With this game, however, the only time this mechanic will ever work is when the enemies are in a very specific sprint animation, and this sprint animation that they need to be in is a sprint animation that they only do when they are outside. If they are in any kind of internal environment, they will not do it. Like right now, they're not doing the sprint animation that I need, and these enemies are on me because that is the spawn that will happen whenever you take out that one guy. And in order to deal with these guys, I'm going to use a mechanic from the Evil Within 1, only in this game it's a lot more reliable. So in the first Evil Within, you had the ability to use bottles to distract enemies, and you could also use the bottles in an alternative way by throwing a bottle at an enemy's head, making them flinch, and then punishing their flinch animation with an animation. These particular systems were very helpful when it came to the bottles on that game. Although, you could only carry one bottle, the bottle did not go into your inventory, and the enemies wobbled about a lot when they were running towards you, so it was very hard to hit their head sometimes. On the Kibben DLCs, they did change the bottles a little bit, where you could actually carry one bottle in your inventory, but still though, you could only carry one bottle, and the enemies would still wobble around a lot. Well, on this game, they've changed those particular systems. You can now carry up to five bottles, the enemies don't wobble around a lot when they're running towards you, and this is more so apparent when they are not in any kind of fast sprint animation. And there are also some upgrades associated with the bottles that allow you to break out of grabs. And of course, since this is a no-upgrade walkthrough, I can't showcase the bottle break move, but the bottle break move is so cool. It's such a nice homage to Resident Evil 1, because on Resident Evil 1, you had the ability to use defense items to break out of grabs. The defense items that you had available on Resident Evil 1 were tasers, daggers, and grenades, and they did damage to enemies. It's a shame that the bottle break move on this game doesn't damage enemies. But regardless, it's still a really cool system to have, because it's so beneficial in saving your ammo, and it's really helpful for getting rid of any kind of annoying enemy. Oh, by the way, right here, I'm about to show you something that existed in the Evil Within 1, and it's still a thing in this game. Whenever the enemies are in any kind of preset animation that they have to do, you can punish them with a sneak kill animation. And it's definitely intentional, for sure. They would have easily patched that out, but they haven't. And I'm really glad that they haven't patched that out, because that trick is only useful for very specific sections, and it doesn't impact the flow of the game that much. And it's not that advantageous in the slightest. And also... I just feel like it's suitable for survival horror to have systems like that, because a key part of survival horror is knowing how to assess the situation properly and punishing accordingly. I did that just then, so I should be rewarded. I mean, there's no way that guy could respond to me that quickly, so it makes sense why Sebastian could possibly sneak kill that enemy before it had a chance to fight back. I just think it makes sense logically to keep that system in. But I'm now about to make my way over to this house over here in order to obtain the shotgun ammo pouch, and that is a brand new feature entirely in this game. 
So rather than using upgrade materials in order to upgrade your stock, you can now obtain pouches that are littered throughout the environment in order to upgrade your stock on your weapons. And this applies to every single weapon that you have. And the good thing about the pouch system is that the pouches aren't classed as an upgrade, and on classic difficulty, they completely disable the upgrade system on Sebastian and on your weapons, and you can therefore obtain pouches on classic difficulty and amass a lot of ammo. So technically, on a no upgrade walkthrough of this game, you are free to use pouches because they're not classed as an upgrade. And now that I've actually brought up the upgrade system, I think I should actually talk about it. So the upgrade system in the first Evil Within was a pretty basic system. You used only green gel, and the kind of things you were allowed to upgrade were mainly your weapons, and then you could occasionally upgrade Sebastian's stats, but that was just it. You could upgrade like your stamina, you could upgrade your health, you could upgrade melee damage, you could upgrade your weapons, and yeah, it's a pretty basic system. Well, in this game, they've expanded upon the upgrade system a lot more, so rather than using only green gel as the main upgrade material, they've instead allocated green gel to Sebastian's abilities, and they've added weapon parts to be allocated to your weapons. And the main reason why the developers decided to make it like this is because in the first Evil Within, it was hard to decide whether you wanted to upgrade your weapons or Sebastian's stats because of the fact that you only had one particular upgrade material. So the fact that they've added a lot more flexibility with the system with the addition of these new kind of upgrade materials is very beneficial for the players who like to upgrade Sebastian. And on top of that, the upgrade system for this game is a lot more advanced. The kind of abilities you can give Sebastian are just crazy. What they've done with the upgrade system specifically for Sebastian's abilities is they've made it a kind of skill tree system, and there are five different skills you can go towards. You can go towards health, combat, stealth, recovery, or athleticism. Obviously, on Akumu difficulty, since you die in one hit, health and recovery are completely pointless. So combat, stealth, and athleticism are the ways to go, and they're the only skills you really need. I only ever favor the stealth tree, because the stealth tree contains abilities that are completely ridiculous. One of the most important abilities you can get from the stealth tree is the bottle break move, as I've already explained. You can also get the ability to do corner kills. And then there's also a move called the Predator ability, I think it's called. And what it allows you to do is it allows you to press circle on an enemy when you get the red arrow on them. And Sebastian will start moving towards them. And if you press X when the prompt shows up, you will do a unique animation. So it allows you to do a stealth kill at a longer distance. It's... Preposterous just how ridiculous the stealth system is. And then for the combat tree, the combat tree doesn't really offer a lot of impressive abilities. I mean, there are certain abilities that are kind of cool, but I just find them completely pointless. Like, for instance, with the bullet time ability, if you hold aim and you press triangle, time slows down and you'll be able to hit enemies easily. And, you know, it's just kind of pointless to have that, and I think it just breaks the balance of the game a little too much, much like how the stealth tree kind of does that. Although, I think the corner kill is a pretty cool idea. The predator move, I think it's a little too powerful. But the other combat ability that you can get is called the push kick. It's basically an homage to Resident Evil 4's punishing flinch animations with an animation system, where if you shoot an enemy in the leg and stun them, and you press X on them, Sebastian will kick the enemy away. But it's just a pretty dumb move, because one of my biggest problems with the push kick is that it doesn't allow you to... Oh, by the way, right here, this is a big mistake. I try to throw a bottle to lure this hysteric away from me so I can sneak kill her, but I end up throwing the bottle too far away, and then on the second bottle throw, she sees me, because she was at the right angle to spot me as I was coming out of cover. And you do not want to mess with this enemy type whatsoever. This is one of the most dangerous enemy types in the game, because this enemy is incredibly fast. It runs at, like, light speed just to catch up to you, and she has the ability to do multi-hitting combos. She can cancel her attack animations, and she gains so much range with her melee attacks. And she has a lot more health than the standard Lost. You've got to be so careful with this enemy. Thankfully, there's only one mandatory combat encounter where you have to face her in combat. But the, every other encounter with her, you can just do stealthily. And it takes two sneak kills to kill this enemy. And one of the best ways of dealing with this enemy is if you have an axe, you can do the first sneak kill on her. She'll break out of it. And then you can hit her with the axe while she's in the recovery animation. And she will die every single time. And for some reason, with this particular hysteric, whenever she loses you, she always tries to run towards that house where the shotgun pouch was, and then she decides to come back after a certain amount of time. But this is not that much of an issue, because I'm going to be able to deal with her easily, and right now I'm demonstrating the last stone position mechanic and how powerful it is on this game. 
literally, the moment you break line of sight, the enemies will just completely lose you. They will not just omnisciently know where you are, they will always investigate your last one position, and then they'll just lose you. And you can use this to your advantage when it comes to controlling the enemies. Like, it's so powerful. You are so powerful in stealth, and it definitely highlights how much experience Sebastian has gained from his previous experiences within STEM from the first game. And I just like the fact that Sebastian has a lot more options at his disposal, and he feels like a stronger character in this game. Because it just perfectly personifies the evolution of survival horror characters. Oh, by the way, this right here is an optional encounter, but I'm going to be dealing with the Anima. The Anima is an unkillable entity, and she is supposed to represent Sebastian's, like, fears of STEM, I believe. I mean, I wouldn't know because the lack of a model viewer on this game prevents me from understanding the symbolism of these enemies. Like, why would they get rid of the model viewer on this game? That was one of the main enjoyments of playing the first Evil Within. Because you fought those enemies, you understood how they worked, and then you wanted to understand the symbolism behind them. Because the whole reason why those enemies existed was because they had some particular ties, psychologically, to individuals who were plugged within STEM. And... Being able to understand these enemies on a deeper level was so enjoyable when I was reading the Model Viewer, and the fact that the Model Viewer doesn't make any kind of return in this game is so disappointing. But back to the Anima. The Anima is of course a ghost-like entity as I've already explained, so therefore it has the ability to go through walls and it can go through doors, and if it detects you, it will instantly kill you, and by that point you'll have to restart the checkpoint entirely. There's nothing you can do at that point. But just follow the strategy that I did for that room and you'll be fine. The encounters with the anima are not particularly difficult, because they mostly revolve around you just waiting for the right opportunity to move, and the pattern on the anima is pretty consistent. I mean, the third encounter with the anima when you're in chapter 11 can be pretty tricky, because it can be hard at times to discern when you're supposed to move, and there are times where even when you're in cover, if you're close to the anima, she can notice you at times. It's very odd. But hopefully with the strategy I'm going to show you when I get to that chapter, you'll be fine. In all honesty guys, I really feel like the anima encounter should have been a part of the story. I don't like that they're optional, because the end result of the anima encounters is that you get back Sebastian's revolver, and you also allow Sebastian to come to terms with himself and to help him conquer his fears of STEM. Like he literally says at the end of the third anima encounter, that after that experience with the anima, he feels good. Like he feels better than ever. And for him to just go to the end of the game without experiencing that, it just feels so jarring and disconnecting with regards to the story. You know, in the end credits scene when he's with Kidman and Lily, he looks so happy. But it turns out that the whole time that his other half of himself was stuck inside STEM, he was just feeling so down about it. And then magically he's suddenly fine again without experiencing that whole moment with the anima and just freeing his other self. Like, it just feels like the anima encounters were meant to be a part of the main story, but then they just decided to make it a side encounter for no reason. And that's why I make it my objective to do the anima encounters every single time I go through the story on this game, so that it just makes a lot of sense with regards to the story. But that right there was very interesting. You might have wondered why I didn't die just then. It's because during Sneeko animations on this game, you get iframes. That's not how it worked in the first Evil Within. On the first Evil Within, whenever you were in any kind of Sneeko animation, you were completely vulnerable to attacks. And that is something new they've added to this game. They've added iframes to animations that originally in the first Evil Within did not receive iframes. Like, you can get iframes not only during Sneeko animations, but also during Mantle animations, and also during uh, Bottle Execution animations when you follow up with the knife. It's cool that they decided to add this feature in, but at the same time, it's kind of pointless, because there aren't that many situations where you need to use iframes to your advantage in order to save yourself from enemy attacks. So regardless of whether the iframes are in this game or not, it doesn't really change the overall flow of the game, and it doesn't change the overall strategies I'm going to implement in this walkthrough. But let me just resume my tangent on the push kick real quick. So, going back to the push kick, I don't like the push kick on this game. While there are times when the push kick can kill enemies if the enemies are low enough on health, for the most part, all you're really using the push kick for is just pushing away enemies, and the biggest problem with the push animation that you give to the enemies is that during the recovery frames of that animation, they just recover instantly. So there's no kind of delay whatsoever in the time it takes for them to recover from that animation, and because of that, you can't follow up with a stomp after you do the push kick and it just completely destroys any incentive to use the push kick. The only other reason you would want to use the push kick is because when you 
push an enemy into other enemies, the other enemies get knocked over. And I don't know if when the other enemies get knocked over, if they actually are delayed when it comes to recovering from the animation. Because if they aren't, then that just adds even less incentive to use the push kick. And because of the fact that the push kick comes with more negatives and positives, I just don't think it's that good of an ability. But I'm not taking the time to go into this little area over here to get some more resources. In this room here, we'll be able to gain access to some ammo, we'll get a med kit, and then we'll also get some explosive bolts. Obviously the med kit is kind of pointless because it's a combo difficulty and you'll die in one hit, but the ammo and the explosive bolts are definitely handy. And here is another opportunity to punish an enemy during their preset animation by using a sneak kill. And by the way, do not try to stand in front of the enemies whenever they're crawling like that. If they touch you while they're crawling, it will transition into a grab animation and you will die. I mean, you'll obviously survive on the other difficulties, but on the Kumu difficulty, it's instant death. Just because the animation starts doesn't mean that, oh, I'm gonna have an opportunity to break out of it. You are dead, just like in the first Evil Within. But there's the medkit, and I gotta say, the medkits on this game compared to the first Evil Within are definitely a lot more useful, and they aren't so annoying to use. One of the most annoying aspects of the medkits was that whenever you used it, it would cause Sebastian to go into a dizzy state where he couldn't do anything for a couple of seconds. And it completely destroyed any kind of incentive to use the medkits. Not like the medkits were that useful anyway, because, of course, you died in one hit on the Kumu difficulty. But you might have noticed that when I was talking about the medkits on this game, I said they were kinda useless. There's a reason why I said kinda useless. The healing items on this game can actually restore Sebastian's stamina whenever he's low on it. That's definitely one of the main incentives for using the healing items on a Kumu difficulty. But my biggest problem with that system is that you can only use healing items when Sebastian's health is not at 100%. And on a Kumu difficulty, there's literally no way for you to lower your health without dying. So the only possible way for you to take advantage of this mechanic is to only use the syringes for emergencies. Just don't heal at the very beginning of Chapter 2, and whenever you're in a position where the enemies are closing in on you and you're low on stamina, go into the inventory and use a syringe, and you'll only be able to do this about two times before you fully restore your health, and you won't be able to heal afterwards. But be careful in this room over here, there is a guy who's programmed to do a jump scare on you, where he just comes up from behind those boxes, and he actually knows where you are, because even when you try to sneak up behind them, he omnisciently does the jump scare towards you, but you can use that to your advantage because by doing what I just did, I put this guy into a favorable position where I can get the drop on him, and he is dead. So going back to the topic of the upgrade system, let me explain a couple more upgrades that you can get. The final upgrade ability that you can get from the combat tree is the bullet cascade ability. And the bullet cascade ability will allow you, for a set amount of time, to deal increased damage with each consecutive shot that connects with an enemy, and the effect will end when the time runs out or when ammunition runs out. It sounds like a really cool feature, but once again, if you're like me, you're going to find that the bullet cascade ability is a largely superfluous feature, and it's already overshadowed by the weapon part system. Because, I mean, with the weapon part system, you're applying a permanent damage increase to your weapons, you're not having to wait for a set amount of time, and you're not having to wait until your ammunition runs up before the damage just goes away. Like, the only reason I can think of as to why you'd want to use the bullet cascade ability over the weapon part system is if you don't have a lot of weapon parts or high-grade weapon parts, and you have a lot of green gel, then you'll be able to get the bullet cascade ability easily. And if you're wondering what I'm talking about, the upgrade system and also the weapon part system have tiers, and you have to unlock these tiers by obtaining very specific items. For the weapon part system, you need high-grade weapon parts, and for the upgrade system, you need red gel. Oh, by the way, this right here is a feature that returns from the Evil Within 1, and just like the Evil Within 1, it only appears in one chapter. So, because of the fact that I did the first anima encounter, the anima will now populate within this area of Union, and it's actually very easy to escape her. And one of the greatest things about having the anima active is that she despawns all of the enemies. So if you're trying to traverse an area of Union that has a lot of enemies, and the anima appears, you can safely get through that area while she's active. It's a really cool feature, and I'm really glad that she is very easy to get away from, because if it was very hard to get away from her, it would be pretty bullcrap. So the fact that they settled on this kind of design for her is perfectly okay. And you obviously don't want to be detected by her, of course, just like with the first anima encounter, because if she detects you, she will run faster than you will, or not even run, she'll just glide towards you like the ghost that she is, and she'll just grab Sebastian and instantly kill him and just transform him into a lost. I remember my first reactions to the anima when she just happened to appear within Union. 
I was just so surprised, because I was not expecting them to reintroduce that same mechanic that they introduced in Chapter 9 of the First Evil Within, where Rubik could manifest himself within the environment. And Rubik was relatively easy to control as well, because if you were speedrunning Chapter 9, which is what I was effectively doing in my walkthrough, you could get it where Rubik spawned during one specific moment, and you could run past him during the recovery frames of his teleport animation and just hide, and when you hit from him, he could not find you, and if you sped run afterwards, you would be able to avoid Rubik entirely, and he would never spawn, because he would be out of the area very quickly. But that right there is a new pistol that I picked up, and that is a bit of mandatory damage right there. That's nothing new, because on the first Evil Within, there were a couple of mandatory damage moments that occurred in Chapter 11, where, for instance, the ground would break below you and you would fall and take damage, and then there was also a moment where the Shigyo would break the card that you were standing on, and you would just take damage, and it wouldn't kill you, thankfully. But that pistol I picked up is the Laser Sighted Pistol. It's an homage to Resident Evil 4, because on Resident Evil 4, your primary aiming scheme was the laser sight, and unlike other games where the laser sight is purely cosmetic, the laser sight in Resident Evil 4 can hit enemies if it's pointing at them, and even when the enemies are not in the center of the screen, they can still be hit if they are in the path of the laser. So, you would expect the laser sight to work the exact same way on the Evil Dead 2, but it actually doesn't, and the laser sight on this game has a big flaw. While the laser sight causes the camera to zoom in more and allows you to hit enemies at long range with pinpoint accuracy, if any enemy gets close to you and they are not directly in the center of the screen, there are times when you can miss them, even when they are in the path of the laser, and because of the increased zoom on the camera, it makes it very hard to readjust your aim to hit the enemy closest to you. So based on these reasons, I don't use the laser sighted pistol that much. However, if you play the game in first person mode, and you use the laser sighted pistol, you will not have the camera zooming in a lot, and the laser sighted pistol will actually be very helpful. And yes guys, you can play the game in first person mode, it's a feature that Tango Gameworks introduced later on in the Evil Within 2's life cycle, but it works surprisingly well, and it actually affords a lot of additional advantages. When you use healing items in first person mode for instance, the healing is instant, so you don't have to wait for Sebastian to do the designated healing animation before he heals. Also, you don't get stuck a lot in lengthy turning animations when you're trying to run away, and if you are in a position where you're running away from the lost, you can easily get your shots out on them while you're doing so. Because one of the coolest design choices with the first person mode is that the camera is not forced to be aligned with the direction that Sebastian is facing, so going back to the running situation, if you do a turning animation to run away from enemies, the camera will not flick backwards to align with Sebastian's head, and because of this increased level of control over the camera, you can easily prepare to shoot the enemies in the leg when they're running. And this is the first time I've ever seen a first person mode have something like this. In every other first person game I played, the camera is always aligned with the player's head, so you can't do the kind of tricks that you can do in this game, where you can set up for shooting enemies in the leg when they're running, or anything like that. And it's just such a cool design choice. And this is a little side activity right here. I don't know exactly what triggers this little event to happen, because it can also happen in Chapter 4 as well. But when it does happen, the game's going to prompt you to hold square to see where it's coming from. And these three lost will chase this woman into this house over here. And in order to visit her and talk with her and gain some more supplies, we need to get rid of these lost here. And what I'm trying to do right there is I'm trying to lure one of the lost away so I can sneak kill him. But it doesn't go according to plan. And what I'm trying to do is when this guy decides to path away, I'm going to try to use the cover transition mechanic in order to move faster, because that is a thing I've mentioned before. You can use the cover transition mechanic to move faster and close in on the enemies, and if you're crouched, they just cannot hear you. But I make the mistake of standing up, and then I decide to do the cover transition, and this guy heard it, and he spots me. And now the uh, other enemies are going to try to come after me, and now I'm going to have to take my pistol out and shoot this woman in the legs to actually stop her from chasing me, and I can stomp her. And then this guy here does not see me because his car is in the way, thankfully. And this is where I'm going to use the cover transition mechanic properly, and I'll be able to kill this guy, so watch. When you see the white arrow on the cover space, it means you can transition into that piece of cover, and it's always important to make sure you cancel the animation before you complete the full animation, because you can only do the sneak kill once you've cancelled that animation. And that is all three of the lost dead. Oh no, I'm sorry, there's a fourth loss, but this guy is not a problem because he just starts banging on the door. I'm not too sure why this guy didn't try to help out his friends when it came to chasing me, but I guess he wasn't in range to hear the scream that that first loss did. And that is a new feature in this game. 
So, on the first Evil Within, whenever you were detected by a single enemy, you only had to deal with that enemy. It was not Metal Gear Solid 1, where everyone just knew where you were when one guy spotted you. You only had to deal with that enemy. There were a couple of sections of the Evil Within 1 where if you were spotted by one enemy, it would trigger an alarm and the other enemies would start coming after you. But aside from those moments, you only had to deal with one enemy. Well, on this game, the enemies now have the ability to scream, and they do it randomly. There are times when they don't do the scream, and if you get lucky, and they don't do the scream, you will only have to deal with that one enemy. But if they do the scream, they will alert the other lost that are nearby, and they will start chasing after you. And you got to make sure you break line of sight quickly, otherwise you're gonna get swarmed very easily. But I've now saved that woman, and I've collected all the supplies in there, and I've trimmed out all the dialogue that I was putting for my no commentary version. And now I'm about to make my way over to the area that's going to allow us to gain access to the shotgun. And you don't have to gain access to the shotgun from this particular building I'm heading towards. You can gain access to the shotgun via the warehouse that is a part of the main story. But if you go to the optional area, you will gain more resources. The shotgun that I'll be getting is the Sawnoff shotgun, and it is the best shotgun out of the three variants that you can get in this game. The other two variants that you can get are the long barrel shotgun and the double barrel shotgun. But they're not really that good. The long barrel shotgun is the worst variant of the shotgun, because even though it can hit targets at a longer range, it's only capable of hitting a single target, it doesn't consistently stun enemies, and it doesn't do a lot of damage. The double barrel shotgun on the other hand is way better, but I would still consider it the second best variant of the shotgun. The reason for this is because it fires both shells in rapid succession, and then you have to reload. I don't even think it does more damage than the Sawnoff shotgun, and the main evidence I have of this being the case is in Chapter 15 when you're fighting the Effigy boss. When I used the Sawnoff shotgun, it took about 13 shots to kill it on the Kumu difficulty. With the Double Barrel shotgun, it took more than 13 shots to kill it. So, with these reasons laid out, that's why I only use the Sawnoff shotgun and not the other variants of the shotgun. And here is the house that contains the shotgun. So, down in the basement area of this house, there is a computer that effectively serves as a fast travel point between this area and the marrow. The marrow is an area separate from what you see. It's basically a staging area where Mobius operatives can observe the residents of Union in secret. And when you're going in and out of the passageways of the marrow, you're essentially phase shifting, as Liam describes. And that's essentially what we're going to be doing in this part. And this game actually takes a cue from the older Assassin's Creed games when it comes to its concept of loading screens. When you're phase shifting in and out of the passageways of the Marrow, you go into this black area, and you can walk inside of this black area while the game is loading. And in the older Assassin's Creed games, you did the exact same thing, where you're inside of a white room, and you could run all over the place, and you can even attack as well. And I like the fact that they put in this kind of system for the loading screens, because it keeps you occupied while you're waiting for the game to load, and you can even pause the game and the game will load. I'm so glad that they opted for this kind of loading screen when you're phase shifting in and out of the marrow. But this is where I'm going to conclude the first part of chapter 3, so stay tuned for the future parts. Thank you all for watching, and you take care now.